travel bugs. I'm Diane. And I'm Guillermo. And we're two American expats who retired early in 2018 to pursue financial independence and travel around the world looking for our forever home. This vlog is number five on our Move to Portugal series, and we finally reached Travel Bay. Yay! It's August 10th, 2021, and we're ready to make the transition from Guadalajara, Mexico to beautiful Lisbon, Portugal, our next home base. We apply for a D7 visa to enter Portugal with the hopes of obtaining an EU passport in the future. The application process was not difficult, but it does present its challenges, especially at the very beginning when you need a NIF or a tax ID and a Portuguese bank account to begin the process. We use border.io. The process is quick and stress-free. You can get a 10% discount on your online order by using our code Seeking Paradise Bugs. On this vlog, we talk about our flight, our goals flying and baggage for the first time, and we discuss our arrival, temporary accommodations in the towns of Estoril and Trafaria, both near Lisbon, our visit to the nearby town of Cascais, which is a very popular location among expats, and we register Buddy and Che with a local town council. So let's start this video back in Mexico City, packed and ready to head out to the airport. It's early morning on August 10th. We're all packed and ready to roll. The luggage was lined up ready for loading and the dogs had a light breakfast and a good long walk. We hired a private transfer pickup service who arrived on time and took about 30 minutes to arrive to the airport. The first stop was the Sagarpa dog inspection. It was quick and smooth and we got the approved stamp needed to board the dogs on our plane. We were glad to have paid the extra money for Aero Mexico's premier seats. There was a much shorter line to check in our bags and the dogs. We were helped quickly and professionally by the employees. Our COVID PCR tests were approved. We said goodbye to the dogs and boarded the plane. So we have arrived to New York City on our first leg. It was a four and a half hour flight, very good, smooth. And we're heading over to pick up the doggies and make the transfer to the next leg. Our global entry passes came in handy to move swiftly through the lines and we got to the dogs and luggage quickly. And it's about five o'clock now. We got in, got our luggage, got our babies. Let them go to the pet relief area. And now we're waiting on Pet Cab NYC to come and get us and take us to Newark. As scheduled, the one hour ride was comfortable, the dogs were happy on our laps, and the driver even had his fur baby on his. The TAP Portugal check in process was easy and the personnel were very kind. TSA had to pick up the dogs two and a half hours before the plane's departure. So we said our goodbyes and headed towards the boarding gate. We boarded the plane and to my pleasant surprise, first class flying was super nice. We got a lot of goodies and perks. The seats were spacious and converted into sleepers. The food was actually really good. We had all the wine we wanted and even a champagne bottle was offered by the flight attendant to celebrate Diane's birthday at midnight. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Diane. We probably slept for about four hours, which was plenty for us with all the excitement. We had breakfast and we're counting the minutes to arrive. We were almost there. 
Lisbon looked different to us this time. This is not a vacation visit. We're actually going to live in the city for at least a couple of years. It's very exciting, and we are so looking forward to it. We arrived at 11.15 a.m., first in line for immigration and customs, then headed straight to baggage claim near belt 9, where they drop off pets. And buddy. After about 30 minutes, the dogs were delivered, they were in good shape, but a little anxious. We picked up our luggage and waited for the airport veterinarian to do their last inspection. The doctor was kind enough to let the dogs relieve themselves in her office as they had been in their crates for the overnight flight. She reviewed all the paperwork and gave us her stamp of approval plus a receipt. We met David Montero and his private tour company and airport pickup service. He helped us load all our luggage and took us to our first Airbnb in Estoril, 40 minutes west of the Lisbon airport. We highly recommend him and his private tours. He will teach you a lot about Portugal. We arrived to a lovely two-bedroom detached Airbnb, a small renovated annex to the owner's home. It was a wonderful 12-night stay. The hosts are a lovely expat couple who've been living in Estoril for a few years. They showed us around, provided us with plenty of useful information, and became instant friends. If you'd like to stay in one of the cleanest Airbnbs that you'll ever see, find their link in the comments below. Thank you, Dana and Pete. Estoril is a stylish resort town located in the heart of the Portuguese Riviera, a long-established cosmopolitan holiday destination and known to attract the rich and the famous with a variety of fine dining restaurants, world-class golf courses, and a host of numerous notable events. Estoril lies less than 12 miles west of Lisbon and is probably best known for its casino. One of Europe's largest Estoril Casino offers spacious gaming rooms and entertainment from art galleries, sculpture exhibitions, and concerts. I'll be sure to visit their poker room for a dose of Texas Hold'em cash games and tournaments. The mild climate and the annual average of 260 rainless days makes it the perfect beach town. Elegant villas, grandiose hotels, and quality bars are all situated in a general atmosphere of luxury and tailored gardens. Whether for late afternoon reading or dining while watching the sunset, this is a place of choice. Although rents and home purchases are a little high to us, we will visit as much as we can. In Portugal, there are three major internet and mobile service providers. Vodafone, Meo, and Noche. You can get either a cell phone data SIM card for internet access and local calls with no contract, or you can opt for a home package that also includes local TV channels, a landline, home internet access, and cell phone service with a two-year contract if you're moving to a place of your own. Vodafone has a home internet package for 72 euros a month. For mobile data service only, they offer single one gig SIM cards for as low as 20 euros a month. Mayo is one of the largest fiber providers with the most infrastructure throughout Portugal. It's been dominating the fixed line home landline market for a while since they used the existing infrastructure from the former state-owned provider, Portugal Telecom. Their home package is very similar to Vodafone for about 70 euros a month. And for cell phone data since for up to one gig of data, they charge 18 euros a month. Noche has a slight cheaper home package for 66 euros a month and cell phone service only for $18.50. 
Make sure you do your own research when choosing the plans and providers. Pick the one that suits your needs, and if a reliable high internet speed is a must for you, make sure they have fiber optic available in your area. Ask your neighbors for their feedback and honest reviews. We opted for the most talked about among locals and recommended in the forum groups, Vodafone. The service has been good so far and easy to reload data if we ever run out. We pay 40 euros a month for two cellular data sims with Portuguese phone numbers. We continue to use the Tossable Digit service to forward our US cell phone numbers to. It's been working good since we left the States. For a small monthly fee, we can receive calls and text messages on our US numbers. We have the text messages sent to our email, and it is very helpful when using two-factor authentication to access our American bank accounts. Only nine minutes away by car from Estoril, we visited the lovely town of Cascais. Initially a traditional fishing town, Cascais has developed into a popular resort town, filled with outdoor terraces, high-end restaurants, and the shops that make the bay and the historic center a sought-after tourist destination. According to locals, the best time to spend at the beach is from mid-May to the end of September. Make sure you wear a wetsuit. The water temperature is always cold, reaching 69 degrees Fahrenheit in midsummer. On the sea-facing side, you find the Cascais Marina, an important gateway to keeping the traditions of fishing and nautical sports, especially sailing, very much alive. The Cascais municipality is one of the wealthiest in both Portugal and the Iberian Peninsula. It has one of the most expensive real estate markets and one of the highest costs of living in the country. It's consistently ranked highly for its quality of life. Although there is plenty to do in Cascais, we felt it is too small and the real estate is too expensive to live in for us. We don't want to deal with the tourist masses during the summer, and ultimately, overall prices reflect an expat and tourist community. We will be visiting Cascais often. Train access from Lisbon is super easy and fast, and we enjoy the nightlife and live entertainment a lot. Good morning from our Airbnb in Estoril. We are waiting on our driver now to take us over to our six month lease, which is going to be in Trafaria, Almada, which is right across the river from Lisbon. So we're super excited. And uh, so here we are, packing up again, getting the dog crates, getting ready. We have rented this small house for five months as part of the application requirement for our D7 Portuguese residence visas. Well, here we are. We made it to Tafavia, and uh, this is so nice. We absolutely nailed this place. It is one of the cutest houses we've seen in the area, and the owners were always available to answer any questions. We highly recommend this place when you visit this town. We added the link to the property in the description below. So far, I really like it. I can't wait 
to sit outside. I think we'll spend most of our days there. Trafaria is a small parish in the municipality of Almada. It's a fishing town where fishing continues to be a main occupation and economic activity among its population. There seems to be a large elder Portuguese community. Homes were built small with traditional Portuguese styles and the historic decor is reflected in many of the homes, doors, window, and facade tiles. Clearly some renovation is taking place, but the town seems rather untouched by the modern construction surge that happens in other cities. As a matter of fact, there are several abandoned dilapidated structures throughout the town. Family discordia dealing with ownership of these ruins is a common occurrence in Portugal, causing houses to sit and deteriorate over time. Very few people in this town speak English compared to Lisbon. It's a small community where everyone seems to know everyone. And according to locals, gossip travels quickly. There are a handful of small local markets, a main pharmacy, bakeries, and several restaurants serving delicious fresh fish. While the women maintain a plant-based diet at home, We've been following a pescatarian diet eating out in Trafaria. It's hard not to in a region that was underwater 18 million years ago. Fish runs in their DNA. We couldn't get enough of the fried monkfish, the delicious sardines, fried mackerel, the softest salmon that melts in your mouth, and the swordfish accompanied with the typical Portuguese baked potatoes and tomato rice. We were lucky to have a small local market outside of our house where we purchased most of our groceries and the kind owner always took her time to teach us Portuguese. <laughs> Prices were less expensive than the big grocery store chains and we felt good helping the small businesses in town. Cash transactions are preferred among small businesses, but credit cards are also welcome. There's a grain factory on the west side of town. Many locals consider it an eyesore along the wide Trafaria beaches. But this Portuguese port company receives agricultural bulk foods in transshipment operations bound for other ports in the Mediterranean, Northern Europe, and regions of Madeira and the Azores. We found a secluded beach next to the factory where we usually take long morning walks with our dogs. They love it. It is so peaceful and almost no one is ever there. We will definitely miss it when we move to the city. It's easy to get to Lisbon by ferry in 25 minutes or so. And if you want greater beaches, fun activities, and water sports, you can't overlook the shores of Costa de Caparica. It's less than 10 minutes away from Trafaria by car. A must visit during the summer. Trafaria is a very small town, maybe a little too small for us and we really want to experience city living during our first year in Portugal. Lisbon has been on our radar for a while now. Could we consider Trafaria down the line when we speak better Portuguese? Maybe. For now, we're fond of its quaint and peaceful setting, a little place for us to come back and visit the small beaches and our favorite seafood restaurants and shop owners. Within 30 days from arriving to Lisbon, we needed to register the dogs with the local town council. But first, a local vet had to register their microchips and provide EU pet passports. Since we didn't have a car, and the dogs were still a bit nervous adjusting to their surroundings, we felt it was best to have the vet come to us. So we used Dr. Bigodes, a mobile vet who arrived promptly after making an appointment via WhatsApp in English. The doctor was very sweet to Che and Buddy, and she spoke perfect English. 
She administered a test and vaccine for canine leishmaniasis, also known as black fever or leish, caused by infection with leishmania parasites, which are spread by the bite of sand flies. The vet also gave them heartworm medicine and registered their microchips in the Portuguese database. The EU pet passports were issued with all the vaccine and chip information. You'll find Dr. Bigode's vet information in the video description below. So we just got back from Ocean Pet, which is part of the Ocean grocery store chain. And Ocean Pet is like a pet smart. It has a groomer, a vet, the uh, pet store uh, for you know products and supplies. And so we stocked up on the things you need for your dogs here in Portugal. And one of those things is heartworm medication. Heartworm is an issue here. So we got an eight month supply of acelaria. And the reason why we only need an eight month supply is because they do not need to take it in the winter. November, December, January, and February, they do not need to take it. And we also stocked up on Bravecto. So in the United States and in Mexico, we gave the dogs Advantix for flea and ticks. And when we got here, we realized it wasn't working for them. Um, so the vet prescribed Bravecto and you give them one every three months. And that has worked well for Buddy. Lastly, we got Sorofen Duo. And we'll give one to Buddy and we'll give two to Che, because again, based on weight. And this is a dewormer, and apparently you need to deworm your dogs every three months. And the total price, 110 euro for the two of them. The next day we headed to the nearby Junta de Fragueja, the local council to register the dogs. We needed to present our NIVs, passports, SAIC microchip registration copy, and EU pet passports. It's been an exciting few weeks being here in Lisbon. The dogs are doing fantastic. We're slowly adjusting to the lifestyle, finding our way around, and learning the language. My Spanish hasn't helped me speak Portuguese. I've had a hard time understanding anything said to me. I guess it's because I'm more familiar with Brazilian Portuguese from my childhood when I lived in Bolivia. I was actually scolded by a Portuguese waiter for mistakenly responding gracias in Spanish instead of Portuguese. He said I needed to make the effort to at least try in Portuguese first, if not, English is preferred next, and Spanish last. Spaniards and Portuguese seem to have a history, and I will not be making that mistake again. The Portuguese tend to drop their vowels and have many slang words that make learning the language a bit challenging, but not impossible. Although English is widely spoken in Lisbon, basic Portuguese phrases go a long way when visiting nearby towns. We've been using this new app called Utalk where we learn key words and phrases easy to remember and useful in everyday small talk. They have over 140 languages, and if you want to try it out, you can use the link below for a 30% discount. We also notice many of the department stores, large grocery store chains, shopping malls, are basically the same as the U.S. and Mexico. The Cathlon, Leroy Marlin, FNAC, Ocean, Continent are some of the stores similar to the American the Exporting Goods, Whole Foods, Harris Teeter, and Targets of America. We are glad we didn't bring much stuff with us. Things are relatively inexpensive and easy to obtain in Portugal. We understand fuel, car sales, and electricity costs are high, but we don't plan on having a car during our stay, nor get a big place or run high electricity bills. At least we will be using an electric dryer to dry the clothes. Line hanging is the way to go here. High humidity in the winter keeps everything damp for hours and maybe a little bit challenging. If you're an expat living in Portugal that has a laundry line at your house, you're officially Portuguese. There haven't been many foods or things that we couldn't find physically in several stores or ordering online. We found a Mexican store that delivers many of our Mexican favorites, from condiments to snacks, and the area of Martin Moniz is where you find the secret Chinese hideouts, sushi buffets, kebabs, panaderias, Chinese and Indian grocers, and everything else you can imagine. Preparing and arriving to Portugal, was the hardest part of our experience so far. We had a few obstacles and a roller coaster of emotions to get here, but we've made it. It's starting to feel like home, and we continue to meet many expats, like us, pursuing the same dreams. We received a warm welcome from the expat community in the American and France PT Facebook group, 
we had an overwhelming response to our introductory post when we first arrived and slowly we're making friends and getting involved in a few activities. Even the local doggies are becoming friends and our neighbors are always keeping an eye on us. Hopefully we remain in this honeymoon phase. We will continue to document our life as we go back to normal slowly but surely. On the next and final vlog in this series, we venture out and take advantage of public transportation. We find lots of entertainment, our self appointment, and destiny comes knocking. Our long-term rental becomes a reality. You will not want to miss it. Thank you for watching our videos. If you haven't liked and subscribed to our channel yet, this is a good time to smash those buttons to help the channel grow. See you in a few weeks. Okay. Okay.